Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Hello. last session. That this session will be in English. So, if you need or want may, some headphones, may I suggest? I think you can find some uh, on the other side of the room. So, I'll give you a few seconds if you need. So, welcome. Um, health and common good. Should pharmaceutical innovation be considered as a public good? How, what impact could this have on research? How can we accelerate, maybe by merging investments and maybe even research teams? What diseases, which decision makers, and in the end, who's going to pay for all this? When um, most of the scientists on this planet and Bill Gates and head of states are talking about the threat of a new pandemic, I really think the conversation we're going to have tonight is really going to be food for thought. We have two top-notch experts with us. We're lucky to have them, so welcome. Ariel Palkis, hello. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. We're really thrilled. You're a professor at Harvard. You teach industrial organization and econometrics. Most of your work covers impact of changing policies and changing environmental um, on markets, on industrial organizations, market power, pricing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Your work has inspired many government agencies and many private firms. So we're very eager to hear what you might have to say on how we may accelerate and merger common good, policy, and innovation. Jean Tirole, I don't even know if I have to introduce you, but I will anyway. 214 Nobel Laureate, Honorary Chairman of the Toulouse School of Economics. You're, you have a huge span of work from industrial organization, finance, macroeconomics, regulation, and psychology-based economics. All of the above, may I say, inspired your last book, Economics for the Common Good. Gentlemen, the floor is all yours for 30 minutes, roughly. We will have a Q&A session, so please do not hesitate and send us questions like we have done all day through the QR code. We will translate. And uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to come to Toulouse. Uh, what I need, ah, here we go. So uh, I'd like to start the discussion by making a point. And to make this point, uh, I have to give you some background. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background. And in the end, I'll get to my point. Okay. So uh, much of the decrease, so there's general agreement that much of the decrease in morbidity and mortality around the world uh, is due to new drugs, okay? Uh, and though the, to actually quantify the contribution of new drugs to the common good or to consumer welfare as we talk in economics, uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult problem. But most of us who have studied these things think that a dollar invested in research in pharmaceuticals this probably brings more consumer surplus or more common good than a dollar invested in any other industry in the economy. Okay, so given that, we want to be careful to support the research that goes into that, those drugs. So um, you, don't, you can listen to me or not, that's more for me than for you. Uh, there are two kinds of uh, uh, research that go into new drugs. Some of it is very basic research. Uh, it's typically funded by government agencies. Uh, you see it in America in the national research labs, universities, labs at the universities, labs at hospitals. This kind of research is very hard for the firm to internalize, that is to gain the benefits because it's easy to spread across different places and indeed we would like it to spread across many places. So that's the reason it's typically done by governments. The second type of research is uh, done typically by pharmaceutical firms. It's typically more applied. And these are firms that have to cover their costs. Okay? They are profit maximizing entities. They're firms in the normal sense of firms. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to say is we should all realize that the benefits from innovation, they don't have natural, national boundaries. If a drug is done in France, any consumer in any country who consumes that drug gets the benefits from that drug. Similarly, if the drug is produced in the United States. Okay. 
The problem isn't that. The problem is that the costs and the benefits do differ by countries. Okay? So, uh, and the costs are the two forms. They're the costs uh, from uh, the government research. Okay? And then there's the cost done by firms, which uh, can, it, it doesn't, the benefits go across countries and the firm can internalize it. Okay. So now, um, okay. I want to provide some figures, and this is the point I was trying to make. I'm going to give you two sets of figures. One is the amount of drug research that's done by the different countries in this world, okay? So the United States, the NIH in the United States is the National Institute of Health, okay? These are numbers from the OECD, okay? The National Institute of Health spends $31.5 billion a year on drug research, okay? That's about $95 per person in the United States, okay? And, you know, if you count all the rest of the drug research that goes on in America, you get to a slightly higher number, $135, okay? Europe, the government spending on pharmaceutical research in Europe is $16 billion. That's about 0.07% of GDP in these countries, which is one third, so in the United States, it's 0.21% of GDP. So uh, relative to GDP, you're doing one third of the research in government agencies as we're doing in America. And actually, I hate to say this, but France is on the lowest end of this. It does $127 million worth of public research, uh, which is $2 per capita. Um, you could, they, it is true that in France, there's a rebate for R&D in pharmaceuticals. That will bring the number up to something like $10 per capita. But however you cut it, it's much lower than in any other country. Okay, so that's one point. So um, I'm going to skip this. So what I want to conclude from that is uh, go backwards. The cost of basic research, of this basic research that underlies pharmaceutical research is uh, unequally distributed among countries, uh, with the U.S. funding a vastly disproportionate amount. Okay. Um, okay, so now we go to the profit part for the firms, okay? So the differences in firm profits across different countries depend primarily on differences in prices across those countries. Uh, differences in the costs are small, and the costs themselves, the marginal cost of producing the drug after it's been uh, developed is very small. Okay? So almost all the differences in costs across countries are uh, of benefits and profits across countries are due to differences in prices. The U.S. prices for pharmaceuticals are notably higher. So there's a general accounting office study okay, which compares uh, the prices in the U.S to four other countries, one of them is France, okay? Uh, and they're between two and four times, so the US prices are between two and four times, actually 4.36 for France, which is, again, the outlier, okay? Of the prices in the, uh, am I good? Okay. Of the prices uh, in, the, in Europe. So Americans are paying four or two to four times as much for each drug that you're consuming than the Europeans are. The differences are particularly big with new drugs that have just been developed. So these are, the num these are two big, maybe blockbuster drugs in the end. Humira, which is an anti-rheumatism drug, you can see the prices. In the United States, a tre treatment for Humira is uh, $4,480 a year. It's $1,570 in Germany, and it's $1,088 in, in France. <clears throat> Keytruda is a new lung cancer drug. Uh, lung cancer is maybe the most prevalent form of cancer. It's $87 for a treatment in the U.S., $34 in the U.K., and $27 in uh, Germany. Okay, so I'm going to conclude, okay, and this is the point I wanted to make. This is one of two points I wanted to make. I'm going to conclude that the cost of producing new drugs fall disproportionately among Americans, okay, but the benefits from consumption of the drugs go disproportionately to countries outside the U.S. because we're paying more for the same drugs. So the benefits go more to Europeans and the French and other countries also, by the way, developing world also, which are even lower numbers. I want to rush to say this is not the only area 
where the outcomes from national policies flow across national borders. Okay, we heard about um, climate change in the morning, and it's probably true, okay, that, that Europe has, all our countries are doing too little. It's probably true that Europe is doing more than the United States. I don't know the quantification of that, but it's probably true, okay? So there are, there are benefits. The problem I want to point out is the situation in pharmaceuticals is about to take a very sharp and drastic change, okay? The reason uh, it's taking this change is uh, there's been pressure put on the, American, the Biden administration by policymakers and uh, politicians, okay, that drug prices in Europe are four times, price, uh, are one quarter of drug prices in America, and we should do something about it. Okay? So in the Inflation Reduction Act, which was just passed in the United States, uh, Biden is going to allow the CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, which is the insurance for poor people and older people, which is 57% of drug expenditure in the United States. So this is a big number. Remember, drug expenditure in the United States is three to four times more profitable than in other countries. Okay? They're going to let them uh, bargain with, uh, <coughs> with the drug companies. Okay? It's something like what happens now in France in the United Kingdom and all the European countries. These prices in these countries, in European countries, are not set by the firms. They set in a bargaining situation with the government which evaluates different things. If, as a result of the bargaining situation, okay, uh, the, uh, the prices in the US fall to the same extent they fell, just the CMS prices, just for Medicare and Medicaid, fall to the same extent they fell in Europe when the bargaining came, like two, two, they'll be now between two, a quarter and a half. The uh, incentive that the profits from R&D activity are going to fall by 20, world profits. That includes the profits of the French firms, the profits of the American firms are all selling to all the markets. Okay, it's not the firms don't know national boundaries either. Okay, are going to fall by 20 or 25 percent, depending on how you calculate it. Okay. Um, this is going to cause large changes in firms' R&D and in the extent of development of new drugs. Okay? So, uh, you know, I want to argue that we're in an, a bad international equilibrium for funding R&D in pharmaceuticals. The U.S. is paying a disproportion, disproportionate amount of costs and paying a disproportionate amount for the drugs they're consuming. So they're losing on both sides. Okay. And again, there are other aspects of international flows where we're not losing, where we're winning. I understand that. Uh, but the change is dramatic. And we're going to see a, a distinct, if this does go through, and it's slated to go through in 2016, by the way. So if it does go through, you're going to see a big hit to the profitability of R&D. And these are companies that need to cover their costs. Okay, they will shut down activities. It just doesn't make sense to keep going if you're not making profits. Okay. And moreover, it's not only it's going to hit, but it's going to hit the wealthy countries, France, the United States, everybody first, because the new drugs come to our countries well before they're spread to Asia and Africa. Okay. That's the point I wanted to make. That's it. Okay, thank you, Ariel. I was mentioning food for thought. This is very controversial. Food for thought. Please do not hesitate to send us our questions if you have any. You may send them in French. We will translate. No worries. And uh, thanks for the pharmaceutical business doomsday scheme. Jean? Well, thank you. If you think about the common good and what we would like to have beyond the veil of ignorance before we are born, what kind of society we would like to live in, we we'll have to ask ourselves, among many other things, um, what kind of uh, pace of progress on drugs you should have. And of course, we would like to have innovative drugs and at the same time, those drugs being available for the most people. And of course, there is a tension between the two because you need also to generate some income in order to make these, those drugs happen. So the, um, just to come after Ariel, I think it was very clear on the fact that there is a general issue with drugs, which is that uh, there is double free riding. Each country would like other countries to pay a high price for the drugs so as to finance innovation. And also each country would like the other countries to have their own NIH or something like that, so uh, as to finance the research and development as well. Um, 
there's actually a comparison here with, with, with climate change, which is a global public good, just like drugs. It's, it's consumed by every country, and, uh, and there's, of course, a huge free riding that we have observed. And 30 years after Rio, we're still at the same stage, more or less. And we need a huge amount of disruptive innovation. And it's not yet coming for good reason, which is a reason of free riding. So that's very, very important. And that's particularly true for certain types of drugs, which are called neglected uh, diseases drugs. So it may be the case that you have a small number of patients, like an orphan drug. It may be the case that you have limited ability to pay, so the drugs which are geared toward LDCs. Or it may be the case there are externalities, like for vaccines and antibiotics. And don't be mistaken, the next pandemic, most likely, I don't want to, to bet, but you know, most likely will be, will be antibiotics, because yeah. we have no new class of antibiotics. We haven't had for decades. There's very little research which is being done on antibiotics. Um, there is huge externality across countries, just like for vaccines. And if you don't have enough public money, it's very hard actually to come up with a business model for those things. So we need to find things. The prime, you know, the best thing would be to have a coalition of countries. Uh, we have seen what, what it gave for climate change, not, not brilliant. Uh, for drugs, uh, there are some discussions you know, like at the European level, for example, for antibiotics, but also in other countries, uh, try to form a coalition. But again, there is free riding at work. So we see that a number of countries actually don't want to pay for antibiotics. They want to profit. And actually, our theoretical research at TSC shows that actually you should expect a lot on, of free riding, unfortunately. So you need other mechanisms. We may cover them later on. That's one challenge. How do you solve the collective action problem? The second challenge has to do with, uh, with the fact that we are, sh in Europe more particularly, uh, we have a shortage of innovation cap capacity, which capability, which uh, uh, of course there are exceptions, fortunately, but uh, is very worrisome. So you all know that for tech, if you look at the 20 top firms in tech, there are 11 American and 9 Chinese. Europe is nowhere. Now, it's a bit better for healthcare. Um, if you look at the top biotech and pharmaceutical companies in the world, out of the top 15, you have three in Europe, including Sanofi in France. Uh, so it's a bit better, but for how long? For how long? We don't know, because there is an incoming disruption by Chinese and American tech companies who, of course, invest a lot in, in drugs. They have the data, the connected objects, they have genetics. They have AI capability, we had uh, AI earlier today, and totally unlimited cash. So what the healthcare business is going to look like in, uh, in say, 10 years from now, I don't know, but I'm not that optimistic, despite the fact that we actually have a lot of talent in Europe. Um, we'll have to solve for, um, sorry, we'll have to solve for, um, I'm just, still learning to use that after all those years. Um, we have to, to address the critics of intellectual property. So, as you know, talking about the common good and discussing drug is very difficult you know, on the policy front, partly because it's so emotional. It has to do with life and it's quite normal, but it's actually very difficult to have a rational debate on this. Now, there's no question there's been abuses of intellectual property, especially for patent drugs. You know, there have been various tactics which have been used. You have all read in the newspapers about insulin in the, in the US going, the price going through the roof, people not taking insulin anymore. Uh, you have heard about Dalaprim, which is anti-malarial medi medicine, and again, the price going through the roof. But I would say it's, it's a shortage of competition there. There are various ways of, uh, of creating competition. So if you think about Dalaprim, for example, you can import from the many generic producers in India and you solve the issue. You have to regulate, you could regulate, you could relax uh, requirements for bioequivalence and so on. That's one thing. Um, the, I'm just, yeah. Then you have this issue about, and that's a more, much more difficult issue, which is about high, high prices for new brand name drugs. So think about anti-cancer drugs, drugs for diseases and the like. 
And still going back to market power, you have this issue about killer acquisition. So there's always a danger, by the way, it's not specific to drugs, it's all true, also true in tech, where the incumbents might buy their future competitors and that might be an issue. And tomorrow we'll have to, do, to deal with uh, data barriers to entry. And we haven't done that yet. So there are many challenges. But the most difficult one is really this issue of high prices for, for brand, brand name drugs. Okay, so how should we think about it? And this is a slide which might be a bit more controversial, but you know, we have to start thinking about the world we like to live in, behind the veil of ignorance, not a world in which the drugs fall from the sky, but a, a world in which you know, they have to be produced and innovated, uh, having disruptive innovation. So there are numbers running around. Um, so. Uh, usually it's one or two billion dollars. What they exactly mean, we don't know. The only thing we know is that they are extremely expensive. If you really want to have an innovative drug, you have to put in a lot of money if you factor in all the, the probability of succeeding, actually, which is very small. So what we need is, of course, subsidies for disruptive research. So we need some kind of NIH funding the way it's in the, U in the US, and we still have to do that in Europe. That will be very important. And for the rich country, we need prices which are high enough to finance the investment. Now, you're going to tell me if the prices are high, we don't get any benefit from that. That's not true because you still use the drugs, maybe not as much as you should. You, then you'll get the generics down the road and there are scientific spin-offs, so there are actually a number of benefits. Um, and there I will have to say maybe the rich countries have to assume their responsibility. Um, you know, the best thing we can do actually in terms of development is give free access to medicine, give free access to disruptive innovation, uh, which are going to help the poor countries fight climate change and do various policies like that, which are going to be a transfer toward poor countries. And if we don't, as rich countries, don't assume our responsibilities in terms of R&D and drug prices, then that's going to be table. Um, we should, of course, not let uh, the industry delay the entry of generics. We should regulate bargain with the companies the way we do it in France and in Europe and will be done in the US. Um, we have to increase the efficiency of the healthcare sector. That will take a few more common good summits for that. Um, and in, some country, in most countries, it's rather inefficient, the US being particularly bad on that front. But we also have to, do, to adopt some kind of integrated view of healthcare. So the integrated view of healthcare is really to think about healthcare in general, so both intertemporally, but also across hospitals, outpatient med medicine and drugs. So it's very important. So about 10 years ago, we had new drugs for hepatitis C, uh, you know, the, the blood, which gives you some liver cancer and things like that. And those are fabulous drugs because they, they cure the thing perfectly, no side effect, once and for all. Um, Prime, they cost $40,000 or 40,000 euros. And you say it's a huge amount of money. In the particular case, it's a no-brainer. Because actually, even if you forget about the suffering and the death, actually, you make money by paying 40,000 euros because you save all the treatments down the road of people who are suffering from that illness. But there are cases where it's more complicated, where you, you, have, to, you have a trade-off between all those things. So maybe... Maybe I, I will conclude here because I think it's much nicer to have a debate, but there are a number of things we have to work on and think about the optimal mix. So you have the three Ps. Three Ps is a push, pull and procure. So, you know, you start subsidizing R&D, you do fundamental R&D, then you try to pull the innovation once you know better what it's going to look like. So in, in healthcare, it's called clinical trial grants and things like that, maybe prices, maybe advanced market commitments. We, we could go into the detail of what it is. And then you have the procurement mechanism, which is important. And that raises a lot of issues, which I just want to raise. I'm not going to solve them, but who is going to pay for the innovation in the end? Is that going to be the users? Uh, by the users, uh, it's not only the people, it might be their hospital, it might be their, their healthcare insurance and so on. So as to get some market test, is that the taxpayer? 
is that independent sponsors, it could be the World Health Organization, it could be Gavi, or is that uh, the overall healthcare system? So, you know, I was mentioning that for antibiotics, there is in Europe a lot of free riding, nobody wants to pay for them, but everybody agrees that we need some new antibiotics. So what the European Commission has proposed is actually to bypass the veto that you have whenever you, you have a new tax and try to, to actually have a mechanism in which the biotech startup in Toulouse, when it discover a brand new antibiotics, will actually receive a voucher. And this voucher will be transferable and could be sold to a big pharma so as to extend uh, the uh, length of, of patent on a blockbuster by three, six months or a year. Now, is that a good policy? Is that a bad policy? The only way to know is actually to try to think about the consequences in terms of welfare. So that's a different branch. It's a branch of financing. That's also something we work on at CSC. But let me stop here and that will be move on to the discussion. Thank you, Jean. Just because you mentioned it, you mentioned antibiotics and patents and everything, there will be a debate tomorrow morning on this topic with uh, some companies. So, uh, thank you for the questions from the audience. First one, I think this is one for you, Ariel. Uh, is spending really a good proxy, the good proxy, for health R&D productivity and relevance? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, there, is there is no good, no good proxies, proxies, let me just say. say. The, the, the thing, thing we know, know is if you don't have R&D and expenditure, expenditure, you won't have new drugs. drugs. Okay, okay. So, so the opposite, opposite is true. The, the reason, reason it's so difficult, difficult to measure the productivity, productivity of this stuff, stuff is because, because as John, John was telling you, you the, the, the distribution, distribution of outcomes is very skewed. So you, if once you start averaging over, you don't get... A, when you average, usually in empirical work, what you do is average out errors. Okay, um, you, you don't, when you average on the pharmaceuticals, because there's such a large tail, the variance, is, it's very imprecise. Moreover, when you have different firms doing it, you would think, you know, you could average over the firms, research policies on the same thing, but they're correlated. There is science out there. Okay, and, uh, you know, uh, by just averaging over firms, you're not, it's the same science that's determining what you can do. So you don't average out the errors. So it's a very difficult thing to measure the outcome, the productivity or the outcomes. What we do know, again, is if there's no R&D, there's no drugs. This is a question that follows up, sorry, of course you can uh, speak. Perhaps it's okay for the U.S. to pay for drugs innovation that benefit Europeans, given that the USA, GAFA, don't pay taxes in Europe. Here we go. Who wants to answer that one? Let John answer. Well, I think we should not mix uh, different issues. So, yes, the GAFA has to have to pay taxes in Europe, and that's why we are negotiating treaties so that they, actually the multinational will be paying taxes in, in different countries. Um, but for one thing, the GAFAs are not doing it for the moment. As I said, they are going to be very important in the future for healthcare, but no, not for the moment. Um, whether the, the rest of the question, is that okay for the US to, to pay for drugs? Well, yeah, wonderful. This is really, I'm very happy with the current thing, but that's going to be the end of the story. And when you see what, what's happening um, with climate change, I think Ariel mentioned that earlier, then there's there's huge amount of free riding by the US on climate change. And don't be mistaken, the Biden plan is not a green plan. Christian Goli has computed the current in terms of uh, price of carbon. It's very low price for carbon. The behavior of American citizens and companies have not changed because there is no carbon price. It just hasn't changed. So um, the free riding, the temptation to free ride is there. For some reason, the U.S. has paid for most of our innovation. We benefit from that. I wish we will continue like this, but we are not going to continue like this. I think there will be a more... Uh, yeah. Ariel, um, do you want to add something on that? No, I, I can stay with that. I go to the next one. Okay. okay. I have a question if, okay, in between, if I may. We saw uh, the gap 
uh, regarding R&D investments and the prices. You mentioned Keytruda, the lung cancer, which is a very innovative drug. Mm -hmm. What is the risk that all the companies, and biotech companies mainly, end up in the US, given uh, the, the doomsday scheme you gave us? I don't think um, where they're located is, there is a bit of that, okay? Mostly for produ production facilities. So production facilities can go in different countries, it just oh, doesn't I'm thinking matter. about prices. Um, prices or, re so maybe ask me again, maybe I didn't understand the question. The, the um, companies can be anywhere. You know, they can do the R&D anywhere. They're going to sell and the prices they get is where they sell. They will sell to the market. If there's a bigger market in the United States, they'll put more effort into the U.S. market. And that's just, it's just a firm. They're maximizing. Uh, they, you know, so if you make the situation hard on companies here, they'll move to the United States or they'll move somewhere else where it's more productive for them. Do you believe this is a threat? Well, I think the companies are mobile, so they can always move. But not only the companies, the people can move. Mm. And one of the difficulty we have in France is that we have a lot of talent, but some of the top talent actually is working in the US. Mm. or sometimes in Germany or in other countries. So, you know, if we want to have uh, startups, and again, there is talent in France, but if we want to keep our startups, we have to have an ecosystem. And th those startups will be creating, I mean, just look at BioNTech, right? It just, it's creating an enormous exactly. amount of wealth and, and jobs in the process. So, but it's a broader issue, which has nothing to do with drugs. You know, it's, it has to do with, with technology in general. Uh, if you don't have the universities and the, and the ecosystem to keep your talents, and you are losing. And you know, the fact that I was citing there is not a single European company in the top 20 tech firm, just look at the amount of money we are losing in the process, the jobs we are losing in the process. It's huge. I'd, let, I'd like to go just one step further when you said um, rich countries must, much, must assume their responsibilities. <laughs> Excuse me, your three Ps, uh, push, pull, and procure. Does that mean we have to have more early access, more fast track, uh, so drugs get on the market much faster? Well, the fast track issue is another issue which has to do with how safe you want the drug to be. It's clear that if someone is about to die in six months, then you, the risk is, is more justified. Uh, you know, some more experimental drug is more justified, of course. but. I think in terms of the financing, it's, it's different. I, I really insist on the fact that we have a responsibility vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world. We are the rich countries, and you know, those other countries don't have the means to do the R&D, they don't have the means to often to buy the pills. So the idea that every country should be paying the same price for drugs, for me, is not the right thing. And I would say the same thing for green innovations. So if we did more green R&D, uh, which, by the way, requ requires a carbon price because you cannot monetize your green R&D if you don't have a carbon price. Um, those, the prices for the licenses for this green R&D should be high in Europe, should be high in the US, and should be very low in Bangladesh. Okay, so that, that should be the case because that's one of the best things we can do for the world. I, I agree with that. I mean, I think the argument is very, it's very simple, which is uh, it's... Um, a common good argument. The developing world, or much of the developing world, simply cannot afford to pay for the drugs. We don't want to let people die at that rate. You know, an economist would say they have a higher marginal utility of income. <laughs> okay, so you could argue, get, argue it that way, but I think fundamentally it comes down to social responsibility, and I would agree with John on that. Okay, a question from the audience. Should we and could we encourage a healthier lifestyle to reduce the demand on drugs? Tell me. Uh, I think you're, I, I think yeah, you I want think to the go for it. Obviously, yes. It's funny, you know, it's yes for two reasons. One, it's just a good thing to do. But the other thing that I think people don't realize is if you have a healthier lifestyle, you as an individual, okay, will, there's a, what we call a moral hazard problem. If you get sick, you're not paying for it. Okay, Mo for the most part, the insurance is paying for it. In this country, the insurance is, France, is, the, is the government. So you're, by you not keeping your health up, 
you're causing a cost to the rest of the country. And uh, so there's also just the argument, I shouldn't be an economist all the time, there's just the argument that it's nice to see people who are healthy and they live longer and everything else. But the, the truth of the matter is, you, by keeping, by keeping yourself healthy, by not keeping yourself healthy, you're causing costs to everybody else in the economy. So, yeah. And how do we convince people to do that? This is a little <laughs> bit wishful thinking, isn't it? Well, that was the question. Should we? And could we? Could we, I so guess. So can we? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I guess it's a little bit uh, like many of the other issues in carbon and green stuff. You, you have to convince people that it's worthwhile to do. It should be easier with health than it is with uh, climate change, seeing the benefits of climate change are not as tangible and not are as immediate. Um, I think for the most part, at least in the United States, the way you get people to listen to things is you put something striking on TV, which is where they pay their, where their attention span is for the most part. Or social media. Or social media. So I remember when the immigration stuff was happening in the United States, the thing that really got to people uh, was uh, pictures that New York Times and CNN journalists going to the border and watching them, you know, take families apart, kids crying. This got to people. He had to, Trump had to stop. You know, it's those kind of things that I, I, for healthcare, I don't know exactly know how you do this. But. You talk about speed to market. Do you mean modifying trial pro protocols? You want to take that? John? Making it easier, quicker, more efficient? Well, there's a trade-off, of course. Uh, if you make it faster, quicker, the risk uh, of, of you know, putting on the market things which are dangerous. And again, there's a, there's a trade-off. But you know, the, of, obviously, if you have a pandemic, for example, then you right, we managed, we managed we during man the pandemic. Then, then, of course, you want to take more risk. I mean, there's no question about that. So, so it's really a trade-off. Um, and as I said, you know, if people are dying, you, know, you, you need to, to speed up, and you know you're taking the risk. But you know, but in the end, it's it's the kind of thing that we we have to. Those are ethical trade-offs in a sense. And we know that we are not there. Jean-François Bonfond was here earlier, but yeah. you know, those ethical trade-offs we are always worried about doing because it involves you know, comparing lives, comparing various people and so on. And, and we are very, always very nervous about doing it, but let me just say, we have to do them. Uh, we have to engage in those trade-offs, even so they are very unpleasant to contemplate. And that's what an hospital does everywhere. It's not only approving drugs, but you know, hospitals every day, they, they, they trade off uh, different, start, different lives. And because they have a limited budget and in the end, uh, life has a price, unfortunately. So, so we need, we need to, to, to have a, a debate on those things. And by the way, so I think that uh, in our country, the debate for uh, ethical debate has, has improved. I mean, during COVID, you know, we were able, there was triage. Uh, not, you know, not everybody could get a bed at the start. And you know, there was some uh, selection. So you, you basically say, you know, we sacrifice this person to save this one. You know, typical kind of thing that makes us very unhappy and uncomfortable, but we had to do that. And that was debated on TV. And there was not an uproar, actually. It, was, it went really smooth. I, I was expecting a, a big uproar, but in the end, it worked out fine. It was an emergency. It was an emergency. Yeah, it was an emergency. But, I, mean, I just want to add one thing. I think in the United States, there is a lot of trepidation of letting a drug go to market before there's extensive and really extensive drug trials. I think part of the reason isn't so much the particular drug, but if one thing goes wrong, people will start worrying that the FDA is not doing its job, the Federal Drug Administration, mm. and that's going to impact things for a long time to come. Right, and, one and, mistake yeah. and it's over. Yeah, I think that's part of the reason. Okay, this is a question for you, maybe, Jean. How can we incentivize big pharma to provide drugs in developing countries regarding what you mentioned earlier? And the uh, big pharma, of course, or any, any one for that matter, has little incentive per se to provide drugs to developing countries because, of course, you, know, you cannot cover the cost of your research. And, of course, everything else being equal, they would like to do that, but it's not 
profitable. It's, it's a lot of money. So either it's part of a charitable donation in a sense, or there are other ways to do it. The innovation comes from, from the private sector. We should not forget that. But the public sector can do stuff. So I was in Washington a month ago. Uh, try to push uh, an initiative of Michael Kramer and other people. You, some of you have seen Michael Kramer in a previous uh, Common Good last Summit year. last year. Uh, because they, they are trying to push mechanisms like advanced market commitments to actually create markets somehow so that it will become profitable for a biotech or a big pharma to actually push. And so antibiotics, it can be sometimes just procurement. So for example, hepatitis C, I was mentioning earlier, you, still, you know that there's still lots of people in the US suffering from that. And you know, they want actually to eradicate. You know, in France, it doesn't exist almost anymore. You can eradicate, but then you need to procure stuff, but mostly to do disruptive innovation. And you need those mechanisms. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about exactly what kind of mechanisms you want to have. Uh, you know, one, the old style mechanism is just to give a cash award to the innovative company. It's called a prize with a Z, and that has been used over centuries. But you need to ex know exactly what you, what you want, so you describe the innovation in a very specific way. Now, what Michael Kramer has been pushing is, is something a, a bit more market-oriented, where you describe roughly what you want to do, and you allocate a budget for that. You commit to spending buying a number of units of the, of the drug at some advantageous price. But it's not for one particular company. If, if someone invents something better, then you can shift the budget. So it's a commitment by the government, but not a commitment to a given company so that, in you know, that sense, you create some competitions. It's one of the many things. And you know, we in Toulouse, we work a lot on incentive. We've been working on incentive for, uh, with many applications, but that's one of the things that we want to pursue in our healthcare center. We saw advanced commitments during the COVID. So mm -hmm. I gather from what you say that it's not an exception, but an example? Or? That's one example because, yeah, of course, there was, there was this emergency, but there was also this, uh, you know, you, you need a big push, right? Yeah. And a big pull at the same time. And just one, and Ariel will have many more things to say than I do about this, but one thing which is very important for industrial policy, which has been used by DARPA in the US quite a lot, and has been used for COVID, is that they wanted some outcome, but they didn't select, the government didn't select the technology. And remember, we didn't know there were at least three technologies for, for vaccine, and it turned out that messenger RNA was the best, but mm. nobody knew. And the point is that, you know, they didn't select a technology, they, they, said they selected an objective, which is very different. Ariel? Yeah, I think the COVID stuff is a very good example. If you have an emergency like that, and they just put out money for, for they gave money to several different companies. Some of them failed, by the way, and that's, you have to expect that. You cannot, you know, expect every one of these things. There's more failures than there are exceptions. So. You know, when government gives the money to somebody and they lose, they don't, this, this project isn't successful. This doesn't mean that the whole idea is wrong. Um, I actually think there are a lot of ways to change the structure of the pharmaceutical industry uh, to increase its profitability. Um, among them, the way we do mergers, uh, the way we keep labs separate or not, or allow mergers to go through. For example, the idea of vouchers, yeah, I think it would be good to allow a biotech firm to sell a voucher for the patent for with the drug to a bigger pharma firm, which knows how to, you know, produce it, knows how to sell it, market yeah, it. Yeah, and they don't have to go through the the, the emerger authorities to get uh, to to allow this to happen, because if it has to go through the merger authorities, it's going to take time, effort, and money, money, which is not spent, which is not spent well. And you think this is a sustainable shortcut? I think so. For the whole I industry. You know, I, we should talk to the people in the industry before we do anything like this. They know more than I don't, but it's something to discuss. Okay, thank you to both of you. I have just one last quick question. We saw during the COVID, Gavi, COVAX. What could we create today to have this push between countries? for these vouchers or for? Yeah, 
At some point, we have to have an inst international institution. Well, I don't we know. have one, WHO. Yeah, the, yeah, the WHO doesn't, well, then I mean, we have to give it more power to enforce things. Voilà. Uh, um, the politics of this are complicated. I mean, the international politics of uh, climate change as well as health for very similar reasons are really very difficult. Jean? Uh, and the WHO, WHO will be a solution, but we know the governance is complicated, just like any in institutional organization. So I can just mention what uh, this Michael Kramer and a group of economists are doing in the US. Uh, they tried, they're getting money from, from corporations and also multilateral organizations. They're getting money from Google and Microsoft and many others. Amazon, I think, I don't remember exactly the list of donors. They, they get money from governments and then they, they are going to spend this money, but they will be private sector oriented. So they will, they will be more you know, in the style of what uh, public sector DARPA does. Uh, kind, of, uh, kind of mechanism, but uh, yeah, we need to spend the money right, and that's that's going to be the big challenge. Because I think that there are a com number of companies who are actually willing to help, a number of governments, despite their free riding, which might be able to help. But of course, there is also tension about where the money will be spent and things like that. So, so you need you need some uh, trustworthy people. I'm not saying economists are trustworthy, but. You know, some trustworthy people who are going to actually make, make this happen with the amount of money which should always be limited. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. I mentioned we would have food for thought. We certainly did. Controversial, not a, but it's very interesting. And stay tuned. There will be another debate tomorrow morning on drugs and common good. Have a great evening.